All righty, everybody. We're about ready to kick off our next talk. Uh, we're going from Google to the other leader in uh, the public <laughs> cloud, uh, AWS. And uh, his shirt pretty much says it all. If you can see it, just keep calm and uh, launch the Debian AMI. Without further ado, this is uh, James Bromberger. Good morning, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Yay! Feel free to move closer. Feel free to move closer. So my name is James Bromberger, um, and technically I, I, my day job is I'm a solution architect for Amazon Web Services, uh, which is something I've been doing for just on a year now. Um, but let me take you through firstly what I'm going to cover today. Firstly, a, a bit more about who I am, just so you've got some background. Um, what is AWS, which uh, I, I'm going to be pretty quick on because I'm thinking most people here have probably come across it at some stage. Um, and then uh, generally go through what Debian is doing with AWS. So most of this talk is actually going to be given from my perspective as a Debian developer for the last 12 years or so. Um, and, and obviously the things that I've been trying to do from, from the Amazon perspective to try and help Debian and, and obviously what, uh, what Amazon is, is getting out of it. Um, We've got a, a boff that I'm doing tomorrow, Future of the Debian AMIs. Um, so this will probably overlap a bit with what some of the stuff we're doing uh, with Jimmy and the guys. Um, and uh, I've got a meeting coming up tomorrow for things that AWS can actually do for, for Debian. So if you've got an idea of something you want to do, um, come along and, and I'll see if I can help you or find the right people and, and um, you can take advantage of, of whatever AWS uh, pieces you want to play with. So anyway, um, who is Jeb? Uh, and obviously that's a TLA. Most people here, I would imagine, have had TLAs over time. Um, I've been a Debian user since about 95, a developer since 2000. Um, I ran Linux Conf AU. Anyone here been to Linux Conf AU? The Australian National Linux Conference? Zach, yes? Okay, so the next one coming up in January. Uh, if you're looking for some warm weather uh, in January, come to Australia. It's in Perth, in my home city. Uh, I am not running it because I ran it in 2003. Uh, once bitten, um, but please come on down. Um, I went to DevConf 1, I've got some proof coming up of that, and I went to, uh, to Edinburgh. Um, so yeah, uh, the proof. Who here is in there? One? Okay, where are you? Where are you, Zach? In there somewhere? Okay, I mean there are a bunch of people still here who were here. Um, I, I, I do this for my own embarrassment more than anyone else's. Um, we all know and love Colin Watson on the right. Um, and uh, Thomas Langer is somewhere around here as well. Um, and, and Martin Mickelmeyer, who's not here this year. Uh, Christopher Lamenta. Um, and a bunch of other people. Is that Andres? Scaldi? Andres Schuldi. Yes. So a long, long time ago. Uh, many memories, but anyway, so let me skip through the bit about what is Amazon Web Services because hopefully a lot of people have uh, have already come across this. So it's a collection of remote computing services. Um, so that's EC2. Uh, anyone here actually used EC2? Yeah, about a quarter of the room. Brilliant. Uh, a bit less. Uh, it's virtual servers. Um, you install whatever you want on it. You do whatever you want with it. Um, pay for it by the hour. Shut it down when you don't want it. So similar kind of thing. Um, storage, so S3 as a storage service, object storage, whereby the amount of data that you upload is the exact amount that you pay for. Unlike, for example, block storage, if you go and buy a SAN, uh, you typically pay for the entire SAN, you put five megabytes onto it, you're still paying for the entire SAN. Um, with block object storage, you're only paying for the amount of storage you're actually consuming. Um, pro rata, I think it's done over the hour or day or so, um, so it's, it's pretty accurate to what you're using. Um, networking. Uh, obviously, storage and compute is pretty useless without a bit of networking. Um, you want to be able to connect to stuff, so we do a hell of a lot of networking. Um, and one of the more recent things that we've been working on has been virtual private cloud. Um, so public cloud has been around for, uh, what was it, 2006, late 2006 when Amazon started this. Um, virtual private cloud is an extension to that to allow you to define your own private network, potentially with no public internet access to it, um, that you'd connect to using IPsec. Um, or potentially open VPN or any other VPN technology you want. Um, or private fiber, uh, if you so wish to, to connect into your private resources. Um, and load balancing and, and other stuff in there as well. Um, and there's over 30 services that, that AWS offers. So EC2, compute, is just one of them. S3 is one of them. Um, load balancing is another service. Over 30, including things like um, hardware security modules, one of my favorite ones of the last sort of nine months or so. Um, anyone ever used a hardware security module? Yeah? Nice. So we have these available uh, in AWS now. Um, basically, for, for those that aren't familiar with them, um, if you've seen uh, um, Mission Impossible, 
how uh, this message will self-destruct in five seconds. These are the devices that if you try and attack them with a screwdriver, uh, they will zero themselves. It's for managing your crypto keys securely. Um, and so I think it's uh, the SafeNet Lunar SA devices that we've got. Um, and you basically have them by the month as you want. Because so, you know, security is an important thing. Everyone here agrees security is important? Yeah? Brilliant. Um, but also, on top of all of those kind of services, it's also supply chain logistics and operational excellence and certifications and audits and operating at massive scale and, and trying to drop those prices all the time and, and living up to what we feel is going to be a, a good experience for our customers um, and uh, making compute work for people as effectively as possible. But more importantly, um, for EC2, uh, customers get to choose the software they're going to run. Um, there's a whole bunch of Amazon machine images, or AMIs, um, that you can choose. And for a long time, there's not been official Debian images on there. It's you know, been pretty straightforward to, to make your own one. Customers can, can master their own. Um, but this was one of the things that, I, as a Debian developer, I've been sitting there going, we should answer this. We should have a Debian image, which people can trust and run, as opposed to finding some unknown AMI that they may not know of, or may not trust, or having to, to make their own, which, you know, I've spoken to a couple of people here who've said they don't know how to do it. That's fine. It's, it's not straightforward to begin with if it's your first time using EC2. Um, it does get pretty easy, um, and I'll demonstrate how we do it in a second. Um, so let's start with some of the other things that, that Debian is doing with AWS. Firstly, uh, I don't want to steal his thunder, but um, massive distributed Debian package recompilation. Um, this is not my project. Um, this is Lucas's project. Uh, so Lucas has been uh, recompiling the Debian archive on EC2. Um, I organized a, a grant for him uh, since I've been at, at AWS, and there was one given the year before. Um, and effectively, it's just recompiling it. Now, I'm sure Lucas could, you could talk about this at length on this kind of stuff. Um, but what's been interesting for me is that, that Lucas chose to use our spot market for actually provisioning the compute power. Um, the spot market is uh, a very interesting place where you can get very cheap compute. It's basically putting in a bid on the unused capacity on the cloud. Um, so we have a, a couple of pricing models. The on-demand model for pricing is it's this much per hour. Turn it on for as many hours as you want. You turn it off, you stop paying. But of course, if we've got all this equipment up and running, then why not give us a bid and pay a price for what you think is a fair amount? Um, and if nobody else is using it, it's yours. If the market price goes up, then you'll lose your instance, you lose your compute. So obviously, you wouldn't do this for all kinds of compute processing. But for things like recompilation of binaries, you could restart that pretty easily. Um, and so it, it becomes a, a very interesting and very cheap way of getting large amounts of compute. And so Lucas has a, a post on his blog uh, about what he's done for this. Um, and it's a, a great example of using that, that spot market for, for compute. Um, the price does change over time. Um, and so you can actually see the history per um, availability zone for Amazon. Um, and per instance size. So that's two, two interesting concepts we need to talk about. Um, Amazon has a, a whole bunch of global infrastructure. Uh, we generally talk about a region as being a, a geographic location where customers can use compute and storage. Uh, and so we have nine of these worldwide. Um, uh, one is reserved exclusively for the US government, uh, but the others are uh, Dublin, Sydney, Singapore, Tokyo, Sao Paulo in South America, uh, US East, our original one, and, and um, California and Oregon. Um, now, each of those regions has multiple availability zones, at least two, and you can think of an availability zone as being a cluster of data centers. Um, and we transparently add and remove data center halls to those availability zones over time. Generally add. Um, and then the demand for each size of instance, and a size of an instance is an amount of compute power and memory that's being allocated to your host. Um, the, the demand does change over time. And so we've graphed it so you can see what is the current spot bid. And as you can see from this graph, um, the on-demand price for a medium, which I think is about uh, seven and a half gig of memory and a, an amount of compute power, um, of which we have our own metric for compute power, because if you've, anyone here bought a CPU before? Anyone? Yeah, everyone's bought a CPU before. Um, d you probably can't buy the same CPUs today that you were buying in 2005 or 2000. And so we have a standardized metric that we've come up with to give a, a kind of quantitative feel to how much power is against an instance. And so a medium has got uh, two compute units worth of power. A small has got one. Uh, a large has got four. Um, so obviously that's kind of doubling each time. Um, 
So the spot pricing on here was between uh, 1.8 cents to 3 cents an hour with the yellow line uh, uh, dropping around. So that's between 80% to 88% cheaper than the standard pricing. So this is a, a perfect use for, for Lucas's uh, project. Second thing we've been doing, um, and this has kind of been um, an experiment that I've been doing for about five, six months, um, working with Raphael on http.debian.net um, to give us a little bit of help on getting the package archives available within AWS's regions, uh, but also making it available to customers outside of those regions. And so uh, we've been using CloudFront, which I've set up as cloudfront.debian.net. Um, you're more than welcome to hit that web page, and it'll tell you, hey, why don't you try and add this to your sources? Um, and it'll actually, uh, uh, http.debian.net uh, for certain regions will redirect you to cloudfront.debian.net. You can use it directly if you want. Um, CloudFront is our global CDN. Uh, currently has 42 points of presence. Um, the last two opened about two weeks ago in Chennai and Mumbai in India. Um, and we're constantly expanding that. And it looks like you can't see. Can anyone see the map behind that? Yay. Never use gray. <laughs> Excellent. So the idea is that it will accelerate. It's a, it's a caching network. So it'll accelerate it after the first hit for all of those uh, uh, files that are out there and to reduce the load on, on uh, as uh, Jimmy said, reduce the load on the Debian archive uh, infrastructure that we have. Um, so you can use it in app sources or you can use it via the redirector. So one of the things that I found is that um, most objects uh, are, are fine with the default caching of 24 hours. Um, so this is CloudFront's default. If there are no preferences set via HTTP headers, and you know, HTTP headers are the correct way to do this, um, then uh, we'll try and cache stuff for 24 hours using a, a, um, an LIU cache uh, effectively. Um, but obviously some of those files need to be quite volatile. Um, index files, translation files, trace files. Um, we want to force them to be a little bit quicker. Uh, and I put a call out to say, hey, can we get some of these uh, cache control headers added to ftp.debian.org over HTTP? Um, and uh, given the timing, I went, okay, I'll, I'll actually have to try and implement something. So I've got, uh, for certain paths, um, an interstitial web server, which is effectively intercepting some paths and adding the relevant cache headers to ensure that we are pretty fresh on these files. I'm talking seconds instead of 24 hours. Um, and so I was going to give you a, a bit of a view of how this works and it'll give you some idea of what actually you can access via cloudfront.debian.net today and this may actually uh, um, expand. So Debian CD, if you're after CD images, um, if you hit cloudfront.debian.net slash debian-cd, you'll be actually uh, getting a cached copy of the, uh, the CD distribution, including all the Blu-ray images. Um, Backports, the old backports, obviously now deprecated given that backports has moved into the main archives, um, is there. Uh, but the interesting bits come when uh, the project file and the dists uh, actually goes off to this little server of mine that I've set up on EC2, which is that interstitial server, just adding on those extra cache control headers. Um, and the default page, the page that some of you may have just seen, is coming from an S3 storage bucket. Uh, it's what, about four kilobytes worth of data. Um, and so what happens is from each of our edge locations for the CDN, uh, the path mapping looks like if you ask for anything under slash, then it goes straight to that storage bucket, which is why you've got that, that web page with the little logos on it. Um, if it's anything like slash Debian, then it goes directly off to ftp.debian.org, caching it for 24 hours by default. Everyone with me so far? Um, beyond that, uh, if it's looking at Debian disks, then that goes off to my EC2 instance, which adds these extra headers on, saying, well, instead of the default 24 hours, because there's no headers being returned from our upstream, um, let's whack on, I think I, I made it a default of 15 minutes expiry. So the cache is pretty fresh. Um, and then for certain other paths, like Debian CD and Debian Archive, goes directly off to those, because you know, um, Archive generally doesn't change that much. Um, and of course, this happens times 42 locations worldwide. Um, these locations do do collapsed forwarding. Anyone, anyone familiar with collapsed forwarding? Um, so, so uh, anyone run Squid before? Squid 2.6 used to have a brilliant feature that um, if you came to your Squid server uh, with like 20, result, 20 requests for the same URL at the same time, it would actually pause all 20 requests, do one request to the origin, and then service all requests simultaneously as opposed to, hmm, I want you, I want you, I want you, I want you, and, and basically just uh, channeling all 20 requests in, in parallel. Um, CloudFront Edge locations do that same kind of collapsed forwarding. 
um, so that if we do get a stampede of traffic, it's not going to be propagated to the upstream origin servers. But each edge location does operate independently, so we will get uh, 42 times number of requests times, what, 24-hour TTL on those objects, which is perfect for packages. Packages don't change once they've been uploaded, do they? Cool. Cool. Um, so uh, that interstitial server is basically running Apache with that kind of config. Certain paths I've decided, uh, and I kind of put this on the cloud list and asked around, and um, this is kind of what we've ended up on. I'll, I'll go through the, uh, the individual paths and the timeouts that I've, I've whacked on there. Um, and this is not set in stone. If there's a path that you see that you want fresher through the CDN, let me know. Um, if you want to jump onto that box, then give me your SSH key. It's, it's being run from the Debian account on Amazon. Um, I will give access to any Debian developer who wants access. Just come and talk to me. Um, so uh, that's kind of the Apache config. Uh, summarizing it into a table, we've got those kind of paths and those kind of timeouts. So things like, um, where is it? The uh, Debian project trace files, 10 second timeouts. You can see they're, they're pretty fresh. That's kind of what I was thinking was going to be an appropriate level of caching versus an appropriate load on the upstream servers. Any questions on any of that? Feel free to jump in at any time if anyone's got anything. Cool. So next thing, uh, and this is, I guess, the, the more bigger thing, um, the official images on, on EC2. Uh, and I'll start by saying uh, Anders Ingerman is absolutely uh, the legend that we and, and the HP guys and everyone else is, is kind of putting all of our patches into one place so there's a uniform place for us to go and get uh, our image generation done. Um, so we have uh, official, uh, official EC2 AMIs for Debian generated by Debian developers, and that was the key thing, is that it is this community that has generated them. Um, on EC2, they're available in two ways. Uh, firstly, through our marketplace. So Amazon has a, a marketplace where independent software vendors are putting their software and potentially adding a cost of how much it is per month. Um, and obviously, ours is at dollar zero. Um, and it's also from our AWS account directly. So if you don't want to go through the marketplace, you've got two routes to get to it. Um, it's available in all regions, and it's even now available in GovCloud. However, I don't have access to GovCloud, um, because GovCloud requires you to be a US citizen, et cetera, et cetera. So I have to go with my software and say, would someone please bless this? And, and it goes into GovCloud and it is available. Um, and in fact, you'll find uh, most of this is actually documented on the, uh, the Debian wiki. Um, with all of the AMIs. Every AMI has an identifier. Um, it's different in each region because each region operates independently. Um, so the list is all there and there are templates to go and launch stuff and, and all of that. Um, this is what the Marketplace front page looks like. So you can see all of those vendors that are on there. Some have very high re reputation. I'd say the one with the swirl has a very high reputation. Um, it's great that I, I get to see that being presented at, at conferences with, you know, four, five, seven thousand people, and they'll show the marketplace. And I'm you know, personally very glad that we've managed to get our Debian logo actually showing up on there. Um, and that's what it looks like when you go to the product page, if you're going through the marketplace route of, of getting your, uh, your AMI. So, uh, and directly from our account, um, if you search for our account number that we've got there, then you'll find everything we've got there. So, um, Debian 607, 7.1a, we had a slight re-release after we noticed that um, uh, New SSH in Wheezy has got uh, ecliptic curve cryptography keys in there. Um, come and talk to me if you want to find out about that. Um, and so you can launch them. So as I said, uh, they're all built from Anders Ingerman's initial script. This was a, a shell script which um, basically did everything. Uh, there was very little that I had to do. I found it and went, hey, that that's kind of looks like a nice model. Um, as Jimmy said, uh, they are, uh, Anders is now refactoring this to a Python script and supporting basically all of the cloud vendors in here with all of our extensions and pieces that we need to do. Um, so there are some scripts that that does actually inject into your EC2 image if you were to use it, and you're more than welcome to generate your own Debian AMI, or you can use the ones that myself and, and others have prepared. Um, here are the things it does. One, grab the SSH keys. Uh, you'd upload previously an SSH key into your, your account, the public key, um, and obviously it needs to be put onto that, uh, that instance when you launch it. Potentially resize the root file system. If you've decided to launch your EC2 instance with a 10 gig file system instead of the default 8 gig, then on boot it'll resize it to the right size. Um, and then execute any initialization or bootstrap code that you may have given to your instance to run on launch. Um, 
And it's very, very simple. It looks at this um, uh, uh, web server, this private web server, um, gets this user data blob of text, and if the blob of text starts with hash bang, which smells like a script, we should probably execute it. Um, so it's a nice way that you can actually do all of your bootstrap at launch time and start with a base AMI, and your base AMI might then start to do a few interesting things like unattended upgrades and things like that that you might want to set up optionally. Um, again, uh, the build scripts are all under Apache software license. Um, it uses Eucalyptus to, to do that build. Um, so everything in there has tried to be as open source as possible where we can. Um, there are no call home or updates. Nothing. Um, currently, the Debian AMIs don't fall back uh, or use cloudfront.debian.net. It actually uses directly http.debian.net. Um, it doesn't actually give any other information that it's being used, so you can launch it. And in fact, if you've launched it from the Debian AMI account, not through the marketplace, I have no idea how many people are using it. Um, and that's great for our users' privacy. Um, said that, uh, to access the instance, you SSH as the, you, uh, the default user admin, uh, which was, I think, when we, we launched the Debian Cloud mailing list about nine months ago, and um, one of the first things was, what username are we going to SSH as? Because um, EC2's uh, default Linux, uh, Amazon Linux, um, the user is called EC2 user. Uh, the Ubuntu images, the user that's initially created is called Ubuntu. Um, and every distribution seemed to have their own name. And we thought, well, should we make it Debian? And everyone went, no, because we've got blends and derivatives and things like that. Well, let's make it something that's generically useful. So admin, um, and then sudo to get root. Um, I am repeating this because this is an FAQ. Uh, once you start your Debian image on EC2, um, SSH is admin, uh, not as root. Um, of course, once you've got onto that machine, you could change that. You're free to enable root SSH. You're free to enable passwords if you want. Um, this is completely at your choice because it's your machine once it's started. Um, so, no remote root SSH, no password authentication, but you can change it. You have full root privileges. Amazon does not. We can't tell how much memory is in use on your instances. Um, it's all completely a black box to us. Uh, and if you wanted to track any of that, um, you'd have to instrument ways to, to push that into our monitoring systems. Um, obviously, you run whatever you want, subject obviously to, as we all have, acceptable usage policies. Um, and one of the interesting things I've found has been no broadcast, multicast, or promiscuous mode on your network interfaces. Um, cool. So. Uh, the snapshots for the Debian AMIs are marked as public, which means anyone else uh, with an AWS account can go and inspect them. Um, the, the idea of trust of our images was a very important concept to me and, and I think to all of us. Um, so uh, you can go and ins inspect them before you launch any of them. Um, you might want to create your own AMI, which you can create by launching one of the original AMIs, doing your modifications, and then saving it back as your golden master. Um, there's no problem with that. Or you can use the, the script. That's quite straightforward. Um, one of the questions that came up was, why did we put this into the marketplace? That sounds a rather commercial for a, a non-profit uh, distribution like Debian. Um, well, discoverability was actually one of the ideas that came up. A lot of people go looking for software, and they go looking for it in a marketplace. Um, why would you go direct from our account? Because we can. Um, you can choose it's exactly the same software. It'll have different AMI identifiers because it's cloned into the marketplace account, um, but the software is, is just a clone. There's, there's no difference between it. Um, so what are customers doing with them? Um, as I said before, from the uh, AWS account, I don't have any idea. Um, it's not tracked. It's public. It's marked as public. People can see it, launch it, and there's no log of how many launches that I've, I've seen that, that let me know what's happened. Um, but from the marketplace, I can see some stats. Now, we did this uh, starting uh, end of last year um, with Squeeze, uh, and basically, it's been a, a top 10 product across all independent software vendors um, of the thousands, I think, that we have in there. Um, and it's seen a 5% week-on-week growth, which, if you track over time, um, that's roughly a graph like that. Um, so we're seeing a lot of, a lot of popularity of, of the Debian AMIs on EC2. Um, but then there's a, a, a other questions that come up. Why should we care about having AMIs on there? And this, this comes back to, I guess we didn't have official AMIs for a long time. For some people, it's the first place that they're going to find Debian. Obviously, no, for no one in this room. <laughs> um, but for a lot of people, they'll be looking for an operating system, and they want Linux, and there's a whole bunch out there. Um, and so having a presence there means we've lowered that barrier of entry to a lot of people. Um, 
And yes, they, they can if they want to uh, sign up for a new account on AWS and you can use a micro instance for free for the first year. Um, details are on that URL. Um, but obviously existing Debian users wanted to, to use Debian because, well, it's a pretty good operating system I found. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, users who want to use obviously our vast number of packages we've got that might not be there in every other distribution. Um, and so we, we're trying to obviously lower that barrier for experienced users as well. So this is some of the comments that we've had come out from some of our users that have logged it through the marketplace. Um, pleased to see the team has created official AMIs that you trust, uh, upgraded to Wheezy servers, and it was in the marketplace, and it was all there. I used this image, and it did everything I needed to. And there's an underlying message that comes back from all of the comments, and it's basically that people trust it. And I think that that is a core thing for us to provide that level of trust and, and, um, and reliability. So um, one of the questions that has come up is being the life cycle of images. So we've generated point releases since 6.0.6. .6, um, and I have just deprecated 6.0.6 .6 and released, obviously we had 6.0.7 since the day it was released. Um, and uh, one of the things that we as Debian need to decide is what's our policy on keeping old releases. Um, now I think, I personally have felt that uh, we should keep the last point release of every release that we have. Um, and it'd be great to go back and see if we can get, uh, uh, I don't know, bow, ham, slink. That might be a little bit too old. Um, but whatever we can keep on there, I think it's a great place for us to archive it because you never know, in, in six years' time, 10 years' time, 12 years' time, we might come back and go, well, I want to fire up a squeeze. Where will I find one? Uh, and archives may have moved on and, and time has, has bit rotted things. Um, so I think we, if we do keep that, that'll be nice. But obviously this is our choice as Debian. Um, and so please come along to the boffin and, and um, give us your five cents of what you think or two cents of what you think is, uh, is going to be appropriate for us to do over time. Creating the images. So uh, to create these images, we start with an existing AMI and we launch an instance. Yay, we have a, a, a machine we can work with. Um, we then create an EBS volume, a block storage volume of whatever size. Um, typically I've chosen eight gig. Eight gig seems to give everybody enough room. It's, kind of become a default for uh, EC2 instance sizes on the cloud. Um, and then of course you're gonna do to bootstrap into it, do all of your software installs, anything else you wanna put into there. And the volume is got data on it then. Um, calling the API, you then uh, unmount it and snapshot it. So you have a snapshot that is stored into S3. Um, really important distinction between EBS and S3 is that S3 is replicated into at least three locations. Um, so it's incredibly durable. Um, whereas EBS volumes only exist within the same availability zone as your EC2 instance is running in. Um, and from that snapshot, we've then got a, a, a nice little call where, which is called basically register image, um, and that API call will result in an AMI entry, it's basically a configuration setting, um, referencing that snapshot. And then what you can do is get rid of your volume and instance and you've just kept a snapshot and the AMI entry. Any questions on that so far? Um, so one of the interesting things that's recently happened um, has been that the API for doing that register image has just been improved. Um, a new parameter was added back on the 2nd of August, so what's that, about a week and a half ago, um, called virtualization type. Uh, up until now, this idea of having an EBS volume and doing a de bootstrap into it and registering it meant you could only register para-virtualization machines, PVM, um, which for Amazon has typically been um, the smaller instance sizes. Uh, this new parameter, um, which obviously we'll, we'll be looking to Eucalyptus to see about getting uh, support for that parameter in there as well, um, will let us uh, register the image as hardware virtualization, HVM, um, which is the larger cluster compute instances, um, the instances with the NVIDIA Tesla graphics cards on them, um, and other larger stuff which is coming down the pipeline as well. Um, so that's a quick summary I put together the other night of... Uh, some of the smaller instances, you can see, the amount of uh, compute power they've got, um, the number of virtual cores that are presented, the amount of memory, and whether it's power virtualization or hardware virtualization. So you can see at the moment the images that we've currently got, they're um, EBS backed, so block storage backed, um, and they're using power virtualization. Um, and so our goal is to, to bring up these HVM images as quickly as we can. Um, and also looking at things like S3 backed AMIs, which are the ones which don't use block storage for the root file system, but use temporary or ephemeral storage for that as well. Um, 
Now, currently, the images that we've got, I consider as being base images. It is basically a standard Debian install, as you would get, without choosing any tasks or anything like that. But one of the things that, as a community, we should probably think about is uh, which blends do we want to add in, potentially, as, as their own AMIs? Um, so I was talking to Andreas this morning, whose talk, unfortunately, I'm missing right now, because he's in the next room, um, about getting sort of Debian Med images up there, or the biology images, or scientific images. Um, ready to roll because obviously there's large numbers of people that want to be able to run those and maybe they don't want to wait for the base image to install 400 scientific packages. So we could actually master those images up for them. So yeah, please come to the BOF on Tuesday uh, and talk about whatever you want to see. Um, future directions, so summarizing up those root file systems. Um, we've got 32-bit and 64-bit images at the moment. Uh, I don't know how long 32-bit is going to persist for. Um, but we've got both. These are all questions for us to answer. Um, one of the, uh, obviously we have those images times the number of flavors, times the nine regions worldwide. Obviously there's a vast amount of storage that we're starting to uh, uh, accumulate across all of this. Um, and I'm um, you know, obviously pleased to say that Amazon is picking up all of that because it's obviously good for Amazon. Um, more information is on that wiki. I've been documenting stuff potentially not well enough um, but attempting to on the wiki. Um, contributions obviously gladly welcomed on there. Um, it's a great little resource and it's obviously the, the Debian resource to talk about all this kind of stuff. Um, one of the interesting things that I was passed about a week ago was actually this white paper, um, which is someone who's actually made their own AMIs for doing protein sequencing on EC2. Um, and there's more and more of this as I, as I keep getting my name known as, hey, you're the Debian guy on Amazon. Um, people start saying, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Um, and it's great stuff that, that you know, we are enabling as the Debian community um, for people to be able to do pretty quickly. Um, obviously, it goes without saying that we are hiring. Um, we've got a, a whole bunch of roles. I've spoken to the managers in most of these teams in the last couple of weeks. Um, so if you care about, anyone here care about operating system design? Come on. Everyone here cares about operating system design? Brilliant. Um, if you want, uh, we've got jobs going in, in Seattle uh, with our kernel and operating system team. That's not a get smart reference, that's the kernel operating system team. Um, if you care about packaging in general, yeah, we've, we want you. Um, try and help make it. Uh, we've, we've already spoken, I guess, uh, about packaging cloud specific stuff. Um, but you know, come work with us and, 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 and help us get that done. Um, if you care about CDNs and, and HTTP and, and that kind of stuff, um, the manager of that team also reached out to me and said, yes. Um, Anyone who's likely to be here is likely to know their stuff. So uh, it, again, another area. Um, and even outside of Seattle, um, roles like the role that I'm in, uh, if you like talking to people about technology um, and, and cloud, um, then all languages are, are clearly welcomed. Um, so other resources we've got. So Anders' script is obviously one. The cloudfront.debian.net site uh, or, or reference. Um, feel free to use it as much as you want. Um, here at DevConf, there's a bunch of interesting sessions. So today, uh, Jimmy's session on public clouds and official Debian image status. Um, so we're definitely, definitely going to be there at that. Um, also, uh, this afternoon, how can AWS help Debian? So if you've got an idea for something you want to do, um, come along, talk to me. Um, I can give you some credits, and you can be on your way and, and do whatever you want, abuse it as much as you want, um, and, and try and make something useful and interesting out of it. Um, tomorrow, challenges and questions. So David's talk um, at 9.30, uh, and then the boff tomorrow for me. And that's it. So there's a bunch of people that I do want to thank. Um, obviously, Inders. Anders. Anders needs so much thanks because he's basically put up with all of us coming along and bothering him um, and merging very, very quickly and then reinventing and, and, and basically being awesome. Um, so uh, obviously, huge amount of thanks. Um, Charles, Miguel, Julian, and Thomas, uh, because the Cloud Init package is finally coming together. Um, <laughs> Cloudinit is a way of structuring your initialization data for an EC2, or in fact, a, a general cloud image, I should say. Um, and uh, we haven't had that package in, in Debian. It's a, basically, it was a mastermind that uh, came out of uh, Ubuntu. Um, but now we have that in, I believe, has it made backports yet? I think it has. Yeah, it yesterday. Yes! So now we have another thing that we, as Debian, need to think about is, do we have a base image which pulls from backports as opposed to just pulling from main? And these are the things that I'm not going to sit here and say we should do. I think this is something that we as a community need to decide. Um, because I don't want to put any software in there that, that not a single person in this room believes should be there. It should be stuff that you trust. Um, so that's Cloudnet, blah. Uh, and Lucas and Stefano, um, for your support that you give me of, hey, yes, you look like you're in the right position. Just 
put this together and make it happen. Um, so thank you very much. That's basically me. So let me throw it open to questions and see what I can answer. Steve, uh, microphones are there. You can stand and dance if you want. <laughs> so you talked uh, quite a bit about the, the cache uh, headers regarding HTTP and the app sources. Yes. One of the things that the Ubuntu server team has found is that um, so we've done some work, well, it, work has been done in the past on apt to make it more reliable. We have the in-release thing now where the GPG signatures are in line in the, the releases file to reduce inconsistencies there. Yes. But one of the problems still is that even if you're caching the individual .debs, you have um, your, your indices are mutable over time and there is, you do not have an atomic update of your server. Um, and so when you're talking about cloud scale kind of things where you're talking about tens of thousands or, or millions of machines that are using apt, um, the fact that you have a few second window where one file is updated on the server and not the other um, becomes a problem in yeah. terms of reliability. If you want, if you want your 10,000 machines to reliably apt get update every time without any manual intervention, the fact that you don't have a consistent mirror becomes a problem. Absolutely. Um, and that's one of the things that, that um, Raphael and I have seen and have been looking at, which is why I haven't made many public statements about it so far. Mm -hmm. um, I've been actively using this for about six or nine months on my uh, well, half a dozen instances. Um, in fact, no, a couple of hundred actually, when I've been doing a couple of fun jobs with uh, some customers. Um, and I've seen that since I've tuned this down to the 10 second mark, I've not seen that problem since. Mm -hmm. But 10 seconds was just an arbitrary number. Yeah. We could make it zero and every request would be live, but obviously that wouldn't right. be taking advantage of any of that cacheability. Right. Well, I mean, the problem is no matter what, where you draw that line, your, your files at some point during the day, you're updating. And, and because your, your packages file and your releases file cannot be updated atomically, mm. at some point you have inconsistency on the mirror. So the Ubuntu server team have worked on a, a solution for this, um, which is basically using an S3 mirroring in, in, within AWS, address this by having unique identifiers for each packages file, which is what you have to do in order to make sure you, you, you're always getting the right index file. Support for this has not landed upstream in apt yet, so I think I'm just throwing it out there that if people are interested in this problem of mirror consistency in the cloud, mm. um, there are potential patches out there that it would be great to, to have some help on getting that upstreamed into, into apt and Debian, which is, awesome. as I understand, has, has stalled out over the past year or so, um, yeah. getting that up there. So, Yeah, no, that sounds really good. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm interested in seeing if we can improve that over time as well. Um, and if we want to put S3 uh, mirrors, then we can do that. Um, I started actually by, by creating huh, eight independent S3-based uh, Debian archive mirrors. Um, and then when I was looking at the, the complexity and the jury rigging going on, I thought, well, this would be just much easier to set it up as a CDN. Uh, and I think within about 15 minutes, I was done. Um, but, you know, either way, more than happy. In fact, there's, there's talks now that, uh, uh, since I've spoken to, to DSA in the last 24 hours, um, about putting some more stuff through CloudFront and, and S3 um, to further help. So. Yeah, whatever we can do. Uh, Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, you said there's no multicast and uh, uh, and no premisk mode in AWS. Why? Sorry, no. Multicast. Multicast. Yes, correct. Um, you can't do multicast. Uh, one thing some people have done is they've built uh, layered networks on top of our internal IPv4 network, um, and then they've done multicast broadcast and even IPv6 on top. Um, but by default, our network doesn't allow you to do broadcast, multicast, or promiscuous mode on network interfaces. Why? Why? So going, going back uh, historically when it was all public cloud, um, that would basically cut off, I believe, a large number of, of potential routes that, for exploit. Um, and the number of workloads that actually natively required that was quite low. Um, and so that, that was the choice that was taken then. Um, now, with the advent of virtual private cloud, where you basically carve out your own IP address space and you may or may not connect it to public gateways or not, um, that becomes less of an issue. I don't know if that's going to change in future, um, but that's the current rules as, as to how it does work. If it's, if it's something that you're passionate about, come see me. Um, I, I actually have been rather intrigued that I can put in feature requests. Um, so if you've, if you've got a feature that you'd like to, to request or something that's been bugging you, come and see me and I can, I can put that on the list and it, obviously these things are going to heat maps and get addressed in the, the fullness of time. All right, we've got about five ah, minutes. Uh, one more question here. 
So I was going to ask the question Steve asked, but he's dealt with that. But there was another similar problem that Lenar has run into a lot, where if you've got, uh, so they use been using uh, EC2 for ages to build lots of stuff, and we the problem you hit the problem if you try and run more than one job on a particular instance, uh, you know, apt assumed serialized access, and basically the second one explodes because apt is currently locked. Yes. The database, and we hit that a lot as a problem, and I think that's something else that you know, basically having lots of if you, if you do only ever do one thing on each instance, then it's okay. But as soon as you try and do more than one thing on an instance, then it all explodes. So you're saying um, app needs some more attention? Uh, yeah, it's another problem to think about in the context of running loads of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, apt wasn't designed for all this, uh, and uh, we need to think about that as well. I don't know if anyone's thought of how to fix it, or if you just just don't do that is in fact the only answer. Or well, do stuff in cheroots, which also works. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Steve again. Yeah, I guess nobody else has any questions, so I'll go ahead and burn the rest of your Thank time you. talking about uh, Please stuff. Do. Um, let's see, what was I going to say? Oh, right. So, uh, have you looked into using Juju at all for Debian? Are you familiar with what Juju is? Oh, I keep getting confused because to me, Juju was always the Firewire stack that replaced the old Firewire stack. <laughs> um, now, what is the new Juju? That's, that's package, um, uh, sorry, that's... Juju is service orchestration in the cloud. Yes, okay. so as it's, opposed it's... to putting Deb Debian images together from separate pieces. Wasn't that a Juju as well? <laughs> That was Jigdo. G that was Jigdo. Jigdo. <laughs> Jigdo. See? Right. Yes. No. Juju. Go, sorry. Go ahead. Juju. So uh, Juju is is Canonical's um, solution for providing a, a friendly, you know, client front end for de declaring service relationships between nodes in the cloud and and automating the the the, the orchestration and the deployment of services and everything. Um, I'd be interested to know if Debian is interested in, in having that capability, both, both having the client packaged in Debian, which I don't think is done yet, as well as having, um, you know, having Juju able to deploy Debian instances mm. and not just Ubuntu instances. I think currently, I, my, I'm given to understand that currently you can deploy Ubuntu and CentOS instances using Juju, but not Debian. So there's a, there's a gap there that it would be nice if somebody would and some of, that, some of that gap that, that has been there in that orchestration is the fact that you guys in Ubuntu have had cloud init. Um, and a lot of the th pieces have, have plugged into that as opposed to just a, well, it looks like a shell script, it smells like a shell script, so let's just execute it. Um, and so that's, I think, one of the, the next things that we need to decide is, is uh, for our next revision of you know, 7.2, um, do we pull in cloud init from backports as it currently stands for Debian, um, or do we wait until it's in the main archive? Um, these are policies, not, not technical limitations. Um, and I want to get, obviously, everyone here on consensus that we, you know, with what we're going to do. About using cloud in it, um, I've asked the re release team about having cloud in it and cloud in it ramifest tools in, in uh, stable, and they still didn't reply. But I guess it's easier to have it in backports. Yes. Yeah. Obviously the backports. the only problem is that this it's the only packages we need from backports is yeah. these three. And that's it. So it's a bit of a shame to just have the one exception in a, a source list. Yeah. Uh, but and we have no choice for the moment, I guess. You, you mentioned actually a very important point that we talked about on, on the mailing list, which was, yes, we could go and grab um, cloud on it from backports, but how are we going to get security updates for that? Does that mean that we then need to add backports to app sources? Do we agree with having app sources containing backports for the default distribution? Um, anyone have a feeling on that? Those in favor, say yes. Those not in favor, say no. I think we have uh, great, I have one no. Thank you, Wookie. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Steve oh, again. Oh, Steve. Burn yeah. me. Go on, take my time. Two minutes, Steve. <laughs> I, I think we're going to find a bar somewhere. So this is actually just a comment rather than a question, and I, it may... Hopefully somebody has a question after this because it's kind of a sour note to end it on. But I did want to point out, um, it's great that we have the, the rebuild, the archive rebuild stuff going in the cloud. And I think that's a great use for EC2. Mm. Um, but although you asserted in your talk that Amazon has no visibility into the instances, as a consumer of the cloud, we will not rely on that. And I think that's probably going to be the Debian policy that we, don't, we cannot trust mm -hmm. the results for anything that goes into the archive. So... You know, Fair just, enough. Just something that, that you know. In fact, that's, that, that's one of the things that we obviously say to our customers is, is feel free to encrypt your data before you give it to us. More than happy with everything being pre-encrypted. If you want us to encrypt it again, we can. Um, but to, to AWS, it's just a bunch of bits. Um, 
Yes, there's a, there's a lot of interesting discussions that, that Jimmy and I have had on this uh, so far. Um, but yeah, more than happy to talk to anyone that wants to go on to that. All righty, well, thank you, James. That about does it for our time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.